it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, you know you, you traveled a lot in Talbot County and you met a lot of people, but I think it's always good to, to get the backstory. Every time we do this, I think mm. you, you probably have been able to summarize it very well, but some people are going to be looking at you for the first time with this. And right. So I thought it'd be great just to why you know how did you get here and. Well, that, that's very interesting. You know, the other night we did a, a, a forum with the um, Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the League of Women Voters. And before the forum, my wife, Maria, who's also my treasurer, she said, you know, last couple of forums that you, you've, you've been a part of, you've always jumped right in on an issue. You never really told people where you came from, how you got here, like you said, the backstory. Yeah. So um, I took that to heart and, and uh, I took a couple moments just to basically reintroduce myself to some and introduce myself to others. So um, this is my third, I'm on my third term on the council, uh, trying to run for my fourth term. Uh, I was first uh, introduced to the council in 2007 when Peter Carroll, who was a council member, decided that he was going to step down. Oh. And uh, then my name was put forward by the Central Committee. Uh, and then after a really long summer, um, I was finally uh, appointed to the council in November of 2007. Um, my backstory is that I've been, uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Delaware. I have a degree in criminal justice. Um, I, I'm a member of the state's criminal justice advisory board. I've been appointed to that board by both Governor O'Malley and Governor Hogan. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Opioid Operational Command Center, the OOCC, which is based out of uh, Westminster. Uh, that's uh, some 26 different agencies around the state trying to tackle the opioid uh, problem that we're having here in Maryland and all across the nation. Um, I've been a football coach here uh, in, in Talbot County. Uh, back once upon a time, I coached Little League football, the Talbot Braves actually. We, were, we went 1-7-1 and one that, that year and I guess uh, I've never been asked to come back and coach again. Uh, and um, I was board president of Talbot Partnership for, for a time period, uh, which is of course, you know, uh, a NAGLASI group dealing with substance abuse here in the county and I enjoyed working with Janet Pfeiffer and, and that board. Uh, I was past president of the topic of the Neighborhood Service Center, which is our anti-poverty uh, initiative here in, in Talbot County. Um, I was vice president of that board, was president of that board for two years. And um, gosh, uh, um, my dad was a, a steel worker in Bethlehem Steel for 42 years. Uh, he and my mother raised eight boys and, and my one sister in a two bedroom uh, row house down in Turner Station. Uh, and basically watching my dad get up in the morning and go off to work uh, in those cold mornings and hot summers, uh, the Bethlehem still gave me my work ethic. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom, as you would expect, with that many kids at home, she couldn't do much else. Um, but she was very active in the community. She was active in the PTA. She was active in the Parks and Recs. Uh, she was active in the Ladies Auxiliary to the VFW. So watching her volunteer uh, around the community also gave me a sense of community. And, and so, I've um, been blessed to have uh, a father who was very uh, strong provider, uh, the silent type World War II vet, the ex-Golden Gloves boxing champion, and then having a mother who was very nurturing, very caring, and very giving. So, um, that instilled a lot of, of who I am. Uh, went off to the University of Delaware after playing some football at uh, Dundalk High School. Was a um, all-county all uh, running back at, at Dundalk, and um, I was, I'm a member of the Maryland Football Foundation, sorry, the Greater Baltimore Football Foundation. And so I was uh, selected to that back in 1980. Oh gosh, what is it? 85? No, 82. 82. 1982, before I graduated. Um, and so I uh, went up to Delaware, played a little football with uh, uh, the great Tubby Raymond, who's since passed away. And you know, he was our football coach there at Delaware and played there. And as I said, graduated and, uh, with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And uh, went down to D.C. and worked a little bit down and out in the Northern Virginia area. And then came back up to Maryland and, and started working with the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. And I've been with them for 25 years now. Yeah, and so I, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've enjoyed the run. Um, 
again, gone a lot of places, met a lot of people, uh, been able to work in a lot of state um, subgroups, um, and, and which allowed me to, again, meet a lot of interesting people around the state. You know. So, uh, you know, the other thing I always want to ask is, uh, and I'll have to change it for incumbents, but um, why? I mean, uh, I, this is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a lot of work. I see you guys everywhere, uh, and I'm so amazed and in awe of, you know, that kind of commitment. Uh, but as you know, you know, we, we are living in a really tough time politically mm -hmm. and you wonder you know why do you guys want to run again I I mean, you know this is this is not easy I guess the next last four months of the council maybe less has been really tough on mm -hmm. people. And, and I just so I always want to kind of go back to that right you know, right why well I, again it, it goes back to what I was telling you about a little bit earlier about my mom and my dad and what they instilled with in me um, and running for council back in 2006, uh, 2005 was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I was doing my own thing and I was, I was enjoying doing my own thing uh, until I got a knock at the door um, by some gentlemen from the Republican Central Committee said, hey, Corey, have you ever thought about running for council? And I'm like, no. But, uh, you know, I was um, involved with the prison ministry here in Tarwood County and also up at uh, EPRU, which is the Eastern Pre-Release Unit in Churchill. And I was going in there uh, ministering with, uh, to young men uh, about uh, how to change their life and how to come out and be productive citizens again in society because I think that's the important thing, not so much of what they've done to get themselves incarcerated, but uh, who, they, who they feel they are now and what they want to contribute when they leave the institution. And so I was um, involved in prison ministries. I was running a, uh, a father's group down in Dorchester County for the health department. Um, we had about 10 to 15 guys weekly that were coming in, and they were young fathers. And again, we were trying to just instill uh, in them uh, the importance of fatherhood, uh, which is um, a, a quickly vanishing uh, a segment of our family unit. Uh, you see the number of single moms and grandparents raising uh, children, but the fathers have disappeared. Uh, and I know, uh, again, what it's like to have a strong father provider in, in the household. So I was doing that back in 2004, 2005 and running a uh, father, fatherhood program in Dorchester, ministering to incarcerated men and women here in Talbot County and also uh, up in Church Hill. Uh, and then got a knock at the door and said, hey, you know, would you think about running for council? Um, so that was 2007. Here we are <laughs> in 2018, and uh, yeah, time flies. A lot more information yeah. to make a different decision. Yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> but and and uh, it, it's always that one more thing. You know, I want to do this one more thing. If, I, if we get this one more thing done, then I'll go ahead and and, and I'm done. Um, of course, the hospital has always been ever since I've joined the uh, uh, but a part of the council in 2007. Uh, the, re the rebuilding of the Eastern Hospital has always been that one thing I would like to be a part of, to put that shovel in the ground and say, hey, we, we're finally on the road uh, to building this, this regional hospital. Um, I've been very thankful to Ken Cozell. He's been meeting with myself and Mayor Willie uh, about once every other month. We sit down for coffee and we look at the progress of where the hospital uh, is, is, is moving towards. Uh, he came before council last Tuesday and gave the, the full council an update. Uh, as, as to where we are. Uh, he was gracious enough to come up to MAKO this past uh, summer and brief the entire Midshore elected body on where uh, Shore Health is on its movement of the hospital here in Easton as well as um, the changes they're going to make down in Dorchester County. So that's that one thing that you know, I would like to see done. And then uh, of course we have the comprehensive plan that this current council worked on. We have the zoning ordinance which this council just passed uh, recently. Um, and there are some other things that, you know, personally I would like to see uh, uh, the county move towards. You know, affordable housing has always been the one initial, one thing that I've always given the council a very low grade on. And I think that we need to do and can do a better job to address affordable housing in the county. Um, and, and I'll say that Easton uh, has, has done a wonderful job, a better job, at addressing the affordable housing, um, but not so much in the surrounding county. Now, when I say that, there's going to be some people that's going to see this and going to hear this, and, and they're going to go into a tizzy. 
And, and when you talk about affordable workforce housing, maybe I need to be clear with that. You know, I'm talking about houses, housing for your teachers, housing for your vol volunteer firemen, housing for those custodians that's going to that's going to work at this new regional hospital. So when I talk about uh, uh, workforce housing, affordable workforce housing, that's what I'm talking about. We're not talking about Section 8 housing, we're not talking about tenement housing, we're talking about affordable housing that the working class in Tapa County can live in. As wonderful as Easton is, I live in Easton, but as wonderful as Easton is, not everybody wants to live within the three mile square area that is Easton. You know, there's going to be some people that's going to want to live outside the county and, and enjoy uh, living in other areas uh, around the county. So um, that's that's the one uh, thing that I've, I've said that this council, the previous councils that I've been a part of, have not done a very good job at, at, at how to address that. So when you, when you look uh, at some of these zoning issues, and I know that um, it got quite contentious about the extension of sewer in the Bay 100. There was a lot of uh, anxiety about this being a, a door opener for major development. Why was there so much worry? And you feel that the council uh, directed that, uh, resolved that? Well, I, I, I don't know whether, I guess it's up to the individual whether or not they felt it's been resolved appropriately. Um, why the anxiety, if you're asking, um, I think there was a lot of misinformation. I think there was a lot of um, uh, persons who were fanning flames uh, uh, and, and getting people stirred up unnecessarily. Um, when you look at the, uh, the resolution that the council passed unanimously, that was passed by the uh, um, the Planning Commission unanimously, and I'm speaking about Resolution 250. Resolution 250 that we passed last year, uh, which allowed for the extension of sewer into the Bosman Nevitt corridor uh, in the county. That resolution talked about uh, those properties that were eligible. It talked about uh, the sewer lines that were going into uh, zoning areas that was going to be eligible zoning areas, and then those connecting lines that were not going to be eligible for uh, for sewer. Uh, we looked at uh, lot size. We looked at um, the proximity to the, to the line, and and there was extensive extensive map uh, uh, editing. Uh, uh, or I should say map review um, by the planning office, by Mary Kay Verdery's office, by the planning commission, by the county council. We had many work sessions on, on 250 before we passed it. And 250, in, in my opinion, basically laid out who and who, who would be eligible to go into that sewer line and who would not be eligible for sewer line. We looked at lots that were already improved lots and lots that were unimproved lots. So we knew the number of lots uh, or the number of possible connections on that sewer line before that bill was even passed, that resolution was even passed. That's number one. The number two, you have state law which says that zoning is, is under the control of the local government, either your municipality or your counties. And that has always been the case, that when it comes to zoning, the county, the state has given that right, that authority to the local jurisdictions. Then number three, you have case law, Maryland case law, that when you talk about changing of character, that a, a, a sewer line is not justification for a change of character. To, to, so that a property owner can now raise the question of access to a sewer line. So you already had three items in place, in my opinion, that basically covered uh, um, the question of whether or not uh, a sewer line going into the Bosman Nevitt corridor uh, was a jeopardy for expansion of growth and sprawl and, and all these other nice words people like to spread around. So. Um, I felt quite comfortable that the bases were co were covered, um, and uh, again, I think persons for their own personal gain started fanning flames and raising doubt and, and bringing other things into question um, without basically um, educating people fully on what was done previously, what state law had already said, and, and what uh, Maryland case law had already found in, in those cases. 
Fair enough. Uh, uh, the other zoning issue that popped up, of course, was the short-term rental issue. Yeah. And, and I just, I'll just open that door. So right. yeah. you can summarize your position. Well, um, short-term rental is a right. It is a right in the state. Uh, it's a right here in Talbot County that a, a, a property owner can um, use his property uh, to rent out for persons who are traveling through the county. Um, there was some question about whether or not um, Talbot County in the past had done its due diligence when it comes to regulating enforcement um, uh, appropriately of, short, of the short-term rental process. And, and, and I would say in a grading that we were probably a C. We, we, we were not proactive enough. Um, we did not address those um, one or two problem uh, uh, um, management areas enough. And um, we decided to address that when you when you look at the number of short-term rentals that we had in the county, and I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 132, I believe, somewhere in that neighborhood. So when you look at the number of short-term rentals that we had, um, there was less than two percent um, that were of any that were that were problems uh, that were raised to the level of bringing it to the attention of the planning officer. So um, it wasn't as if you had 50 percent failure rate when it comes to short-term rentals um, um, use in, in the county. So the Planning Commission looked at short-term rental question. They gave us back there and, and, and again for persons who are running around saying that the County Council single-handedly or unilaterally unilaterally, thank you, <laughs> um, was going about changing the short-term rental code. That's, that, that's not true. The Planning Commission looked at our short-term rentals. They gave us their input on the short-term rental process. We looked at it. We sat down with the, with the uh, planning officer, Ms. Verdery. There were some more changes that we, had to, we added to it as well. Um, and there were several public meetings on the question of short-term rentals. So it wasn't as if uh, uh, three members of the council ran out there and jammed the short-term rental uh, process in place. That's, th that's furthest from the truth. Um, what what my um, my take on the short term rental process, process was this is that there was not uh, in any business you look at what what's your failure rate you know if you got a product coming off a product line or cars or batteries or whatever the case may be what's the percentage of this product that is failing when it hits the consumer what's the what's your failure rate and based on that that data. Then you got to make adjustments. Either your 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 procedures are wrong. You got contamination on the line. Your mold is failing and it's breaking before it hard. So you, what's causing the failure? And the question of short-term rentals again, because it was probably less than one and a half two percent that were a problem. You have to focus on what was those pro what what's the problem. So what we did was that we put things in place to address the failure rate. We brought in a co-compliance officer. We're going to re-energize or reactivate the short-term rental compliance board. We brought in a, a, a monitoring agency that's going to monitor uh, uh, social media sites to find out people who are trying to skirt the rules and, and rent without going through the process. Um, we tightened down uh, the, the process as far as getting a short-term rental license. Um, we increased the fines for if you, if you do get caught doing something wrong. Um, and uh, but we we didn't put those in place until next year because we had to vote on them this year. So my my approach was that let's address the failure rate. If you if your if your failure rate is is, a, is contamination in the line, go in and address what the problem is. Don't shut down the entire line. And I think what some people were trying to do because they don't like short term rentals, and it's not a question of of a person liking it or not liking. It. It's a, it's a right. It, it is a right in the county to, to, to use your property in this manner. And what people, some people, were not understanding was that as soon as you take this, as soon as you try, any county try to eliminate short-term rentals, then you open yourself up for another lawsuit on, on the other hand by property owners who are now going to go out and find themselves an attorney and come back and sue you for trying to uh, um, uh, do away with this, this with, with this right. So um, I think that the council as a whole uh, was very considerate, very open-minded. They listened 
to what the planning commission, the planning commission said. They listened to what the planning officer said. Um, they took information in from various segments of, of the population, not from one stream, but from various segments of the population. And we said, we're gonna deal with the failure rate. Let's put things in place to address what's wrong. You don't, and the old cliche the mama used to say, you don't throw the baby out with the bath water. You change the water. You don't get rid of the baby. So what we, tr what we were trying to do, what we're trying to do is address the failure rate. What's the problem? Address the problem. So uh, speaking of problems, uh, we have a, a, a challenge uh, every year with our school budget. And we, uh, uh, it's been interesting as I've covered this issue from county to county, how every organization, uh, excuse me, municipality handles it differently. But um, you have consistently supported public schools. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, it's an expensive commitment. Mm -hmm. Uh, this comes up uh, all every year. Yeah. How you know how do we get beyond maintenance of effort? And um, you know, I just wanted to get a little bit better sense of your your, your thoughts on Talbot County's commitment. Uh, there's special uh, referendum on right. on sure. like a cap front right. to yeah. help pay for some of these capital. You know? I mean, pub, public ed I'm a product of public education. My children are public product of public education. All of my siblings are product of public education. My mom and dad are product of public education. You know this, and and so um, again, my, my parents raised nine children. We all graduated from Dundalk High School. I mean, at one time, for a time period, if you go back and look at it, I think from 1968 until around 1989, 90, there was a pack in Dundalk High School. From my, my, my brother, myself, and my brothers, through my nieces and nephews. So for over 40 years, there was a pack in, Dun in Dundalk High School. So my, my parents um, were, were strong proponents of education. Although my father himself didn't graduate, you know, because he went off to the military at the age of 16, um, but he still understood the value of, of, a, of an education. And he told myself and my siblings, you know, you're going to go to school, off, you know, you're going to find somewhere else to be. And so we, we all knuckled down and did what we had to do. Um, so, again, that's who I am. And, and when it comes to addressing our education problems here in Talbot County and funding is, is always going to be a major issue, um, we try to look for whatever creative ways we can um, to, to give the schools what they need to be successful. <clears throat> Maintenance of effort is, is a state requirement. You have to always meet that threshold, that, that magical formula that they come up with and say, hey, this is your, uh, this is your number for this year. We, gotta, we have to hit it. Um, and when we set that bar for from the previous year, that's our starting point for the next year. We can't go below it. That's our starting point. Um, we have also what's called non-recurring projects and, or, or expenditures, and these are things that don't hit that maintenance of asset, maintenance of effort line item. So um, that's uh, that also helps us to pay for some things that the school would need without increasing that maintenance of effort number. And I think this year we were a, we were successful in getting nearly a million dollars of non-recurring items approved by the state school board. I think eight, uh, I think over eight hundred thousand, if I remember correctly. And that's that's a big number. That's a big number of items that. Um, that we were able to get approved that didn't raise that maintenance of effort bar. So um, yeah, I, I will always be supportive of our schools. Uh, I think that uh, Dr. Griffith and her team uh, have been very transparent with the council. We meet with them probably once a quarter, um, either for a breakfast dinner or for a breakfast meeting. Um, we sit down and, and look over different uh, capital projects. Of course, the main project right now what is the rebuilding of the Moton Dobson Elementary School here in Easton. Uh, we look over our enrollment numbers. Um, we look over other projects that they that they may uh, need to uh, um, to need to accomplish, whether it be new roof for uh, the uh, St. Michael's Easton High School or the St. Michael's High School East Middle High School. So. Um, those discussions have been very transparent and those discussions have allowed council um, earlier in the process to kind of start digesting what the school may be asking for when it comes to March. And, and that was something that we put into place with Dr. Griffiths maybe about two years ago uh, to say, hey, let's start meeting uh, uh, you know, a year in advance, you know, so that when 
uh, when March comes around and we get your budget, it's not sticker shock. I'm like, well, where did this come from? Yeah. You know, we, we, we have time to digest it over the months. Yeah. And then when March comes around, we see it on the, on the line. We say, oh, well, we knew that was coming. Let's go ahead and, and, and address it. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Um, as you know, there, was, there has been a, a year-long birthday party yeah. in Talbot County. Wow, yeah. Uh, this, this very special man, mm -hmm. uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, who, uh, who was a truly American hero. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, uh, I, I cannot think about him and not talk about race relations in, mm -hmm. in our community, uh, about diversity. Uh, you know, we've gone through you and I, we've gone through this together. We, mm -hmm. we went through the Talbot Boys controversy. Mm -hmm. That kind of national conversation has not simmered. It's actually right. in many Still ways there. Still increased, there. Yeah. Uh, even you know, beyond the, the figureheads of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. It's now at the soldier level, uh, so to speak. And I don't really want to rehash that or relitigate it, but I think the idea is that you know, we have been challenged, and yet we have this remarkable heritage mm -hmm. with, with Douglas, right. and this remarkable history, and so I just want to get a check-in on that. Um, it, it's, um, it's really uh, um, an honor uh, to, to, to be here in the birth county of Douglas and to, to watch all the things that have transpired over this year. Um, um, by the Frederick Douglass Honor Society and other groups who have come alongside and say, hey, we want to acknowledge and, and celebrate um, the man that, that is Frederick Douglass and what he meant, not just to Talbot County, not just to Maryland, not just to the United States, but also to the world. Um, I understand that there is a group that, is, that are going over to Scotland uh, later this week uh, because even in Scotland there's a celebration of Douglas's life and uh, there's right. members that are going to be traveling over to Scotland to be a part of that from, from right here in Little Old Top County. Um, last weekend when the Honor Society did their annual Douglas Day which is getting bigger and bigger every year um, my wife and myself and my two grandchildren we were sitting out on the courthouse lawn listening to the speeches and it was a beautiful day and sunny and, 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 and warm um, and after uh, things broke up there on the courthouse lawn uh, there were other activities at, at the library and, and, and over uh, behind the courthouse and I was standing there and a gentleman came up next to me and I was standing near the top of boy statue and he came up next to me and uh, he, he was he, he was commenting about the uniqueness of having the Confederate boy statue there and then just 20 feet over to the left there was there was the Douglas statue and uh, he was from I believe he said he was from Connecticut and he was a teacher he had heard about the Douglas day and he had come down to to witness himself and so um, what I was saying to him, I said, well, what, what better place to bring a, a group of students and sit them in the grass and explain to them about the Confederate boy statue and, and what the Confederacy was and what it stood for, good, bad, or indifferent, and then pick that class up and walk them just 20 feet over and sit them down in front of the Douglas statue and then explain to them about this great man. and. Um, History, sometimes we, we, we may not like where we came from, we may not like what we've gone through, we may be ashamed of what we've gone through, um, it may hurt to think about it. Um, and, and as I said to this gentleman from Connecticut, you know, uh, good, bad, or ugly, history is history. And, and, and we can't whitewash it or tear it down or you know, stick it in, in, inside of uh, closets. Um, it, it's still going to be there. You know, if you remove that statue uh, and, and hid it away and, and buried it underneath the ground, guess what? You know, the movement that is the Confederacy, that is the Civil War, is still a part of who we are. And, and, and uh, burning books as they did back in Nazi Germany in, in the 1930s and, and 40s and burning Bibles, um, guess what? Christ still lives. <laughs> right, yeah. But when, but when you take a snapshot of where we are now, it's two years later, no, probably four years later. I can't even remember when we had this stuff. Right it's been about four years. Four years. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's right after, yeah. So, um, you know, are, are we making progress? And, and just as specifically, we have this incredibly diversifying county mm -hmm. 
thirty percent of our kids are, are you know, speaking seventy languages mm -hmm. or something like that. Well, I, we are becoming different. Mm -hmm. I think. I think. Yeah. It depends on who you ask, and I guess sometimes it depends on the hour of the day and the day of the week. Um, we, we are changing. You know, you sit down and talk to Dr. Griffiths and look at the uh, enrollment numbers for Talbot County and the percentage of, of uh, non-white Hispanics who are living down in Talbot County and how we uh, are, are changing the way we, uh, we educate in, in this county. Um, you look at organizations like, um, like BAM, uh, Derek Daly and his group and what they're doing to try to, to shorten the achievement gap when it comes to African American students. Um, we, we, are, we are changing. I think we're becoming more aware, and, and I think that's the first step to change. Um, and, and I always salute uh, Sheriff Gamble and Lucy Hughes from the Rotary, what they did with Purple Project. Uh, Project Purple is an awareness campaign. There was, there, someone wrote an editor in a paper about two or three weeks back. I was coming back from, from Mexico, and I read it in the paper. And, and they were really slamming Project Purple. Um, and I don't think the writer of that editorial really understood what Project Purple actually is. Um, it, it's not a, what it's not is it's not a silver bullet. And I don't think any any of the founders or organizers ever said if you do Project Purple, you'll never have a, a person in your county with substance abuse. That that was never uh, uh, proclaimed from anyone. It's no it's, it is an awareness. A campaign um, to open the discussion to get people out of the closet, so to speak, and to start talking openly and frankly about um, a substance abuse addiction. It, it, it's better. It, it's it's best to understand before you're understood. So it's best to understand what someone else is going through before you try to force on them um, to un to understand what you're going through. So uh, I, I always try to understand what the man next to me is going through before I try to force on him to understand me. Um, what the Purple Project was trying to do is to, first of all, uh, uh, raise the, the level of conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was saying that even at the state level, through the Good Samaritan Act, uh, the, even, the, even the laws when it comes to dealing with persons of substance abuse, if you are uh, uh, with an uh, individual and he um, overdosed and you make a call to law enforcement, you can't be charged even if they come into the room and they find materials in the room, uh, substance in the room, um, because you made that call to save this person's life. And unfortunately, even here in Tarbert County, if you know the story about the young man who, who died and his friends basically left him on the side of the road because they were afraid. Uh, and the Good Samaritan Law uh, came about because of those types of incidents where you had people who were engaged in, in behaviors that are not really healthy for them. Someone unfortunately uh, um, uh, goes unconscious and the other people in the room, they, they, they don't make a call. And, and unfortunately, people have died because of that. So even at the state level, we've changed laws through the, the Justice Reinvestment Act. We changed the law so that uh, law enforcement officers, uh, probation agents, can't violate somebody uh, if they overdose uh, and, and they're taken to the hospital by a unit. We can't charge them with that. Um, the courts have been put on notice as far as um, how many, how much time they can give a person who's coming before them um, for a violation of probation. It's 15 days on the first offense, 30 days on the second offense, and 45 days on the on the third offense. So you can't just slam them and give them a year's worth of backup time. You have to try to work with them. So that's that's where I think that we, um, as as a people have to understand that when it comes to substance abuse that it is a problem. And uh, I was talking about the writer that was writing in the paper uh, a couple of weeks ago who was really getting on uh, the Project Purple and, and Sheriff Campbell and Lucy and Ms. And Ms. Hughes. Um, it, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, in, in Baltimore City in, in the early 80s when they were going through their HIV uh, uh, epidemic, uh, I remember uh, Mayor Kurt Smoke uh, had an idea to hand out um, hypodermic needles. And, and people in Baltimore sitting around, they thought he was crazy. They thought Kurt Smoke was out of his mind. How, you can't give people needles, are you kidding me? Well, now we call it harm reduction. <laughs> and now you can not, not just give out needles, but the health department, they give out condoms. Yeah. 
That's right. So, um, but he was a little bit before his time yeah. with the idea. And, and, and in 1980s, people thought he was absolutely out of his mind. But um, sometimes you have to think out of the box when it comes to addressing a problem that's so big yeah. that um, you can't you can't address it with the same old format that you used 20 years ago. Yeah. You have to new, use new angles, new ways to address the problem. So we've got a lot of uh, things uh, we can use, but I, uh, we covered several issues. Mm -hmm. But maybe you have some some other issues that you you want to address. And then you mentioned the hospital, but I think that you know it's your turn. Uh, if I've forgotten something, or uh, or you can even just make your case. Well, I mean. Uh I, again, being, being a member of the council, I always called myself a servant leader, and uh, I don't mind being called a servant. I don't mind working with people for people. Um, you know, Douglas said he worked with anyone who wants to do good and nobody who wants to do bad. You know, so uh, I may not be quoting him as this right, but um, yeah, I mean, I've worked with so many different groups from, from people in prison ministries to um, substance abuse to housing issues um, that. Um, you know, sometimes you have to back off and say, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I need time for me. But um, if there's ever a, 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 an initiative or something going on that I think I can help out with, um, then I don't, I don't mind helping. I don't mind getting in and getting involved. And, and I don't have to be the one sitting at the head of the table. I don't mind coming in and standing in the back of the room and listening and then offering something that, you know, that will help further the, the agenda. And so, um, you know, it's not about you know, spotlights, it's not about headlines, it's about getting it done and at, at the end of the day. Uh, and I think that's that's the part of I like about being on the council is, is getting the work done. And you're never going to make everybody happy. And I, and I think, you know, I've learned a, a while ago that if you're making everybody happy, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> you really are. And, and uh, you know, I've always tried to be uh, as open as possible with people and say, hey, look, this is why I'm not voting for this, or this is why I did vote for this. Um, you know, there were people, um, one amendment that was offered up recently was Amendment 4, um, dealing with the zoning ordinance. And uh, I remember talking to someone recently at the, at the public, at the uh, forum we just had, and they came up to me and said, well, I know that was a difficult vote for you. And I said, oh, not really. I said, it wasn't difficult for me. When I sat down and looked at what the amendment actually said, and I sat down and reread Resolution 250 and state law and, and case law. I said, well, no, it's, it's, it wasn't a difficult vote for me. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about trying to look for ways to, to, to accomplish things, working with, with, with people. Um, um, and, and, of course, understanding that you, you can't be everything to everybody. And there are, there are limitations even on yourself physically and mentally. So, um, but... Uh, I enjoy it, you know, I, I um, it, it sometimes can be very long evenings and uh, a lot of nights reading and, and, and I've taken work on, vac on vacations with me and, and uh, sat by the pool and, and looking at stuff, as you know, I called in from Mexico. <laughs> so people, uh, so I don't think anyone can really doubt my, my, uh, <laughs> my call to serve. Um, and if, if it needs to be done, you know, I'm willing to say, okay, how, 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 can we, how can we get it done, you know? And so, um, and if, if, that, if my vote takes some people off, then it's going to happen. And that's, that's just life. Yeah. You know, I can't make everybody happy. Yeah. Um, I'll exp if you want to talk to me, I'll be glad to explain to you why. And I've had, I've had many times been doing this in 10 plus years where I've talked to people and actually they've changed my mind. And, and I've gone and reversed my vote and gone another way yeah. um, because, of the, because of the additional information I've got from people. Yeah. Nothing wrong with changing your no, mind. No, no. How it got such a bad name. <laughs> thank yeah. you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you.